Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, those of you outside our community, welcome to Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. Uh, for our alumni, welcome back. It is great to see you. Um, our speaker today will be a familiar face to many of you, particularly those who have been here for a while. Alex Cheek taught design as part of our CMUQ Information Systems Program uh, from 2009 to 2016. Um, during his career, he has been an educator, designer, and an award-winning entrepreneur. Uh, today, he leads a team in UX design at Google. Before I invite Alex up, I'd like to say a few words about today's lecture. Um, at CMUQ, we are privileged to have scholars and experts visit our campus to share their expertise. We created the Distinguished Lecture Series to showcase the depth and breadth of scholarship of these visitors. Today's lecture is the inaugural Mark S. Camlet Distinguished Lecture in Information Systems. Um, many of you may know Mark Hamlet. Uh, Mark is the Provost Emeritus at Carnegie Mellon University and a University Professor of Economics and Public Policy. University Professor is the highest title that, one, that Carnegie Mellon gives to its uh, faculty. He was also a absolutely key part of the Carnegie Mellon team that established his, this campus here in Qatar. So we're delighted to be able to launch this series in his name. And now, please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Alex Cheek to the CMUQ Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's like I never left. This is amazing. Um, I've had such a blast the last few days here, uh, and, and so um, I'm really grateful for the invitation and, and thrilled to come back and, and see you all. So it's been a minute. Um, I would like to just pick up where we left off. How about that? Uh, this is the very last photo that I took here in December of 2016. Uh, and this was the very first photo I took in August 2009 when I first arrived. Um, earlier that year, I had been a student in Pittsburgh. Uh, I was about to finish a master's degree. And my advisor, Dave Coffer, in the English department uh, knew that I wanted to teach. And this campus was just getting up and running. Um, I didn't know much about Qatar, but I was intrigued enough to have a few conversations. And I met with the dean at the time, Chuck Thorpe. We had lunch together. And I think the building here and the mission here has always really, really fascinated me. Um, in those early days, my colleagues and I, I felt like we were really figuring it out together. Um, we were thinking about how to adapt our courses, how to mimic the Pittsburgh campus, how not to mimic the Pittsburgh campus, and how to create you know, just the right experience for our student needs here. I often tell people that the vibe was like, uh, higher education kind of mixed with a startup. And I was hired to teach design. I was appointed by the School of Design and then later with Information Systems. And I, I really, I felt like I had free reign to explore my teaching uh, and my classes in a way that most young assistant professors just out of school could never get to do. And a lot changed here between 2009 and 16. And I'm sure that most of you experienced that as well. Um, and that's another reason that I really loved it here and, and the reason that I stayed. Um, it was so interesting to be an observer and a contributor too. Uh, off campus, I was just enthralled by the environment, the pace of change, um, everything from these mega urbanism projects to watching how government systems and services were being modernized to Education City itself with new buildings going up, it, seems like, it seemed like overnight. Um, this is a view of Musharrab in 2013 soon after uh, the neighborhood there had been raised. This was a year later. Um, I used to give the best tours of Doha. Um, I would get a call from the dean's office, Alex, and, I would, and there was some dignitary coming over, you know, could you give them a tour, of course. And I would ask them, do you want the tour of Doha or do you want the real tour of Doha? And some of them said the real tour. And I would go up to the roof of the Mercure Hotel and I would sneak them out a fire escape and this is what I would show them. And over the years, you could just see the entire development go up, which is an amazing vantage point. The other thing that I really appreciated about the architecture here were the older neighborhoods. I loved that. 
This mosque is, uh, it's gone now, but it was the most stunning example of Arabian Deco architecture and the concrete was just exceptional. Um, my students also knew that I loved this building so much uh, and I received a text message a few years ago saying that it's gone now. Um, you know, I know that we talk a lot about the, the glistening contemporary skyline of West Bay, um, but I really loved the diversity of the architecture here, especially these forms of modernism. And the vernacular architecture too. Uh, one of my favorite weekend activities was hitting the streets with Tom Mitchell. We would take our SLR cameras out and we'd be documenting these places and we, we knew their days were numbered. Um, this was near Musharrab. I, I don't know if, it's, if it still stands today. I, I kind of doubt it. We met people. Uh, I took this photo when we were out photographing the streets one night in 2015. And while many of those spots are gone, I also got to see these new wonders emerge here. Even before coming here, I was a great admirer of the artist Richard Serra, so going out to East West was just like the coolest thing. And Jean Nouvel as well, the architect who is known for his facades, and I was crazy about this building. This building I snuck into when it was under construction. I wanted to show somebody the top floor of it, and it was like 10 o'clock at night, and I, I grabbed my hard hat out of my car and a construction vest, and Jean Nouvel is also bald, and so I kind of I like charged in there. I'm like, I'm the architect, we're going to the top. <laughs> I taught many courses over the years here. Communication design, information design, industrial design, service, research. I taught a, a seminar called Human Experience in Design, and that was really my brand. You know, it was this all-encompassing approach to design and taking design and, and seeing how it could really be applied in any field of study. And that's why design pairs, oops, that's why design pairs so nicely with business and information systems and computer science. And as a result, I also had really fruitful engagements with um, many of my peers from other disciplines, which I definitely have that in Pittsburgh too, but it was different here. There was a real depth to it that I really appreciated. Design is about ideation and planning. It's about finding collective purpose. And most importantly, design is humanistic. And it bridges disciplines and brings an integrated form of problem solving to the table. And so the designer themselves, and, and what I taught to my students is that they're facilitators and they're advocates and they're systems thinkers. Uh, one of the challenges of the designer is trying to span this continuum between kind of visionary and directional thinking but also being able to articulate practical, thoughtful solutions and being real about it. This, in the simplest possible terms, um, if there is intent followed by action, that is design. Uh, I, I read somewhere once a uh, definition that was the rendering of intent, which I thought was kind of nice, like really nice and simple, the rendering of intent. And in practice, design ranges from the tangible to the intangible, consumer goods to interfaces, uh, designing for services in a hospital to designing the interaction that you might have with your smart speaker at home. And some of these disciplines have been around a lot longer than others. So I want to just like establish a little bit of history here um, before we get into it. Um, on the right here, you see all these different fields of design and, and then the lineage, which in some cases goes back centuries. And up top, we have the more, say, traditional uh, fields of design, or at least when you ask people what design is, they oftentimes think of these tangible fields of design. And those practices date back to the origins of the printing press and the Industrial Revolution and mass production, the rise of consumerism and the advancement of new materials, uh, particularly in the 20th century. The Bauhaus, you might uh, recognize that name. That was a pivotal moment in kind of formalizing a lot of these disciplines. But I'm also interested in looking at design over the last 40 or 50 years. So designing for interactions and how technology and design kind of got woven together. How did that happen? That had a very different upbringing. One of the pivotal moments there that I like to point to was Xerox Park in the 1970s, where these technological pioneers were exploring how computers and tech um, could find ways into our homes and offices. And there was this really wonderful melding of computer science and, um, and psychology and ergonomics and, uh, and the fine arts or visual arts. And it was happening in this kind of brilliant countercultural context of Silicon Valley. And then in the years that followed, you saw Apple do that as well, um, which is like rebellious and risky. And, and that also kind of like, you know, dissolved disciplinary boundaries. 
And all of that set the stage for the 1990s and 2000s. So design built on this momentum. And then the, the term human-centered design was coined. And that's where ethnographic research methods were applied with design to try and understand how to make these complex new technologies kind of simple and accessible for consumers. And with that rise of HCD in that period, um, design also was helping us create these new experiences with, te with technology. It opened the door to other new areas of application, things like service design. In service design, we see these um, applications of uh, in healthcare and government access, uh, serving communities. So you really see design practically everywhere, it seems. Um, and I think that speaks to its adaptability. You know, its methodology can kind of work anywhere. It was a proliferation of design that took us from that static and tangible world and gained a very direct hand at influencing um, our lived experience. Um, and one of the other domains that I'll talk about uh, later on will be about design in business and organizations. So thinking back to 10 years ago with this rise of service design and new technologies, I was here in Qatar and it was a very, very exciting time to be a designer. Design was a practice that was growing and changing really quickly. And on top of it, um, we were in this new age of mobile devices and social media and mass communication like we'd never seen before and lots of new possibilities of interactions. Um, and I wanted my students to experience as much of it as I could. So I'd like to take a quick look at some of the work we did between 2009 and 16 in that golden age of design, if you will. And if it's not immediately apparent, I will say that these were not your normal design classes. In a service design class, I had student teams work to improve citizen services, technology, wayfinding, the visa process, at the Embassy of India in Qatar, and then the year after that at the Embassy of Japan. And the students spent time on site, they met with stakeholders, they were prototyping ideas and interviewing real users of these services, um, and then we went back to our clients with proposals. And a lot of the challenges there were like cutting through bureaucracies and, and trying to create sensible consumer experiences. Also in service design, uh, we partnered with the Mataf Museum. Mataf came to us and they were trying to figure out ways to connect with communities around here, um, looking for engagement and accessibility. They wanted to know um, how to connect with audiences, not just in Education City, but, but more broadly in Doha. And students developed concepts and prototyped um, an augmented reality experience. Uh, they did event programming. I think I remember there was like a mobile museum concept, like how can you take the museum off campus and out into the community, which is really interesting. In an interaction design studio, we worked at the airport to heighten efficiencies and look at the check-in pro process. This was at the old airport. And then at the new airport, we were looking at ways to uh, make longer layovers more comfortable. Here is a Falcon parking lot. Uh, one student who went on to actually work for Qatar Airways after graduating from here developed the wayfinding system at the airport, which by the way is like a designer's dream. And, uh, and it's also like really hard to design, so I thought that was cool. In addition to all these things, we did traditional stuff too, uh, like smart thermostats in an information design class and uh, mapping urbanism and change in Doha. Um, on the left here is a, like a legendary CMU design project where you have to make a cube that elicits the user to rub it, turn it, and squeeze it. And um, that's all about trying to figure out the right affordances of use and how do you invite somebody in and engage with it. Um, and also how do you make your cube stand out when there are all these other cubes that you can choose from? How do you get them to stick with it? And these types of studios were really important because not only did I want students to be out in the real world thinking about high level challenges and problems, but they also needed to be versed in the production of design too making artifacts and bringing ideas to reality. But keep in mind back then, the focus in design was very much about weaving technology into our lives. How do we enhance our lives and our work through technology? And I, my goal there was trying to teach students on how to bring design into their tech careers after they graduated. And I feel like a lot of that process of integration of design and tech has largely been figured out in the years since. I'm not saying it's going great, um, but I do feel like we're past that pioneering phase. So what has changed in the last 10 years are the problems themselves. So the problems have changed. It's now I feel like it's more about 
almost managing technology in our lives, maybe even mitigating its effects on ourselves and in society. So the problems I'm thinking about now are like the rise of disinformation or AI and how it's really poised to disrupt workforces and the speed at which it's changing. I know every generation always talks about like things are moving faster than ever, but like I do actually kind of feel that way now. Um, I'm also thinking about businesses and how completely ill-equipped they are for the next waves of disruption, which is what we'll talk about today. These problems that lie ahead and the ones that we worked on 10 years ago are called wicked problems. These are the types of problems that have no clear path forward. They're hard to pin down. They blend together with other equally complex problems. There might be little agreement on even how to define them in the first place. They're ethically complex. They don't lend themselves to analytical approaches. And they cut across disciplines. So you can't really be a narrow disciplinarian and think you're going to be able to solve a wicked problem. In fact, if you think you're going to solve a wicked problem, you kind of misunderstand the whole concept to begin with. And when I left teaching, I found myself in the corporate sector. And you guessed it, I was thinking a lot about wicked problems in business. And just to be clear, this is not a normal term in business. It's not presented in business curriculum. It's, you don't hear it used in the workplace. Uh, so that was just like me thinking and kind of nerding out on it. And I put together the spectrum. So I, here's, here's how I see it. In business, um, you have tame problems. Tame problems are the ones that are kind of easily contained. And then you have wicked problems. So tame problems are, uh, they're very linear. Things like bug fixes or near-term iteration. Like you know exactly where you need to go next. So it's clear. Okay, great. Logistics, optimization, like there are playbooks for that. Um, upskilling teams. Okay, that's getting a little bit more complicated. Brand perception and client experience, definitely getting more complex. I think because there's a social dimension to that. Um, and uh, I, I think even the word experience alone is a little bit complicated because like, what does that really mean? It could mean a lot of different things. Um, but I will say like, we have methods to design for that. We've been doing that for years. So I feel like the stuff over on the left is like, it's a little bit more easily managed. It's not always that simple, but like we can handle it. Now, the more wicked problems, things like employee attrition, struggles to innovate, producing something of value. The competition is killing us and we do not understand why. Creating a product that has lasting relevance and influence in the market and society. In 2017, I found myself managing a design team at a financial company, a small financial startup in New York, where I'm from. Uh, lots of smart designers on the team. Um, we were trying to help average Americans uh, better understand their finances and try to make better financial decisions for themselves given their respective circumstances. Um, we grappled with, uh, with debt and savings for a younger generation of clients who were oftentimes struggling to even know where to begin with it. We, as the design team, had to learn complex financial concepts. We all went through you know, financial planning and training school. Um, we had to learn a lot of jargon. Just as importantly, we had to understand the behaviors and motivations of our consumers. Many of those people didn't even want to talk about finances, let alone meet with us or our researchers or with an advisor or put together a financial plan. There was a real fear in people that I didn't intuitively understand, so we had to do a lot of research to get to the roots. So talk about wicked problems. You've got your customers with an allergy to your entire industry, and all we were doing was trying to help them. But we, we chipped away at it. Um, we were out on the front lines. You we were delivering online tools and documents and infographics, and, and you, like we had an app, you name it. Um, we were trying to get the right type of content into the hands of our experts and into the clients. And we did our best to kind of contain and solve these problems. And it was a fairly standard design process that you see in tech today is like little pods of designers and engineers and product managers. And simultaneous to this work, the company had just been acquired. The company was acquired by a large legacy, very well-established financial institution. The early conversations that I was in were mostly around how to bring our team into the parent company. And these are very practical conversations, like how do we align roadmaps? How do we merge products and technology with their specific use cases? Uh, another thing that uh, I was dealing with was that many of their teams simply had never worked with designers before. 
Um, they were new to tech practice in general. They were new to product management and didn't necessarily understand it. So there's a lot to figure out. Um, the other thing that I was hearing was a lot of kind of uncertainty. There wasn't a clear or strong vision or long-term direction. And the following question came up a lot. What's the problem we're trying to solve? We hear this everywhere, don't we? We like to say this. I mean, my, I grew up, my father was a management consultant. And so I heard this question a lot and it drove me completely crazy. Um, I think I made a diorama in like fourth grade and he's like, what's the problem you're trying to solve here, son? <laughs> okay, dad. Um, I think what bothers me about this question is uh, that it seems to imply that there's a simple answer, that it can be neatly contained, you know? And as soon as this question is asked, it's almost immediately followed with trying to frame it and define it and articulate it, usually way too soon. So here is the routine. Somebody asks that question in a meeting, you write a statement or two up on the whiteboard, and you take those um, nice, neat problem statements that you did, and you, you get the broader team together, try to gather some more information and analyze that. You generate some solutions, you attempt to anticipate the consequences, a little bit of risk management, and you do a kickoff, and you set some metrics, and then you plan and implement the agreed upon solutions, you validate them, make some adjustments, and you just, you try not to get burned in the process. Keep it safe, stick to the formula, and deliver some solutions to leadership. This is entirely rational. I totally get this, I get it. It was organized and managed, you set some timelines, you were able to justify your work and stay safe. And frankly, this is what most corporate teams are equipped to handle. They all learn these techniques in school and from management. And the problems that you're trying to solve, they're the ones that they see right in front of them. But this approach doesn't go deep. In fact, you miss the wickedness. You were never really grappling with the real problems. You just took whatever you saw in front of you and shrank it down. People always try to te treat wicked problems as if they were tame ones without ever really trying to understand how entangled they are with one another all those bigger problems that are lurking out there. One of the things that I found most interesting about that job was um, traveling out to headquarters. We were in different cities and I wanted to meet with as many people as I could. Um, not just people on the product team or on my design team, but people that were doing all that kind of ambiguous corporate work. And they always wore business attire and I was usually in a black t-shirt and a Yankees hat. <laughs> And I'll be honest, like sometimes they really did not get me or my team or, or why I was asking the questions that I was. But on the whole, they were, they, were, they were great. They opened up about the issues that they faced, the issues as they saw them. And as you can imagine, um, getting them to open up about those issues oftentimes was happening in more informal contexts like lunch or coffee, uh, not necessarily in meeting rooms. You know, if you have a a meeting room, you've got an agenda, you've got to have goals for that meeting, you've got to have action items. Um, so I was, I was meeting them during coffees and lunches and I was trying to get their perspectives. And I took all their perspectives and I mapped them out. I took them down in my notebook and then I would go back to my laptop and um, start diagramming out this big chart. Now, mind you, I had no idea where this was gonna take me but it was just something that I did. I was, I was trying to give shape to the space, shape to the problems. I didn't fully understand what the problems were. I was just hearing a lot of different things. So what do we have here? Um, we have a big complex organization. We have um, lots of perspectives. There's alignment here. That's what these clusters are, like within the boxes, there's some alignment. Um, we have some misalignment. That's what these red callouts are in the italic text. Um, you see some thinking and you see some working in silos. That's what those isolated perspectives are. And this represents a lot of different teams with a lot of different, um, a variety of problems. And it all added up, these contradictions and assumptions. And there was legacy thinking in here and a lot of subjective statements. I mean, it was a real hot take factory. Here, we have some disagreement on whether the company should be honest with itself and just outsource the technology. There was a senior advisor that I talked with and he had a pretty clear opinion that we should not try to make a big cultural shift. The company should just do what they know best, you know, stick to it. Totally, totally valid point actually. 
However, there was another person at the company that said we should evolve and be more tech forward. Some people thought it was important to be experimenting with new offerings and attempt to fend off competition. Also, seems totally valid. But these are fundamental contradictions. Here is a cluster of alignment on the future of the digital products. But then I was also hearing other people that were reluctant to give this team too much leeway in defining the future of the company. And then that led to other problems, like it triggered confusion and attrition. Here are competing perspectives on, how, on who the customers were. There wasn't even alignment on who the customers were and what their needs and values were. And that could just be really easily figured out through some foundational research. Um, but then I was observing other people that had you know, years of experience there, and they, kind of, they felt like they knew what was best for the business, not realizing that the customer had completely shifted beneath their feet. So imagine if you're the CEO, you wanna reinvent the company or you just wanna like kind of modernize it a bit. You wanna make it more adaptable, more innovative. You wanna move forward collectively. And an artifact like this could really help bring some issues to the surface. And um, uh, I hate to break it to you, but you know, finding those issues, they're not gonna happen through more strategy sessions and vision statements and all hands. Um, uh, it, you know, the issues that I was seeing and hearing here, it was just so complex and contradictory and rooted in self-interest. And this isn't just one company, this is shockingly normal. This kind of misalignment on the basics, you know, I've talked with other people at other companies, they're saying the same thing. So this is all over. And, and all of this kind of reflects a mix of problems, organizational culture, structural issues, maybe some management issues, but it's also a reflection of human nature, plain and simple. So to sum up what I learned in this diagram, uh, there was no agreement on central themes. Nobody was fully bought in on one issue or a shared direction. There were clearly some internal cultural issues that were not being talked about. The rhetoric from leadership was about speeding up no matter what it took. And so there was this mad dash to kind of solve all the things, but nobody was ever really aligned in the first place. The big consultancies were there uh, but they had never really validated what their focus should be. And, you know, I, I don't know how effective you can really be moving forward when that diagram was the reality. I, there, there was no ground truth to it. There was no ground. I was a senior director at the company and every day I felt like I was just raking leaves into the wind. So the bottom line, you can't really get a new direction in the company unless you do the work of figuring out the right questions, the right framing and creating clarity. I'd like to show you a few other things. Um, much of this would probably be familiar if you took my classes. We created a lot of storyboards. Storyboards were helping my colleagues better understand our clients. We created a library of personas for the same reason. What you see here is a service blueprint. Service blueprints help take complex behind the scenes processes and connect them to the front end consumer experience, trying to illustrate cause and effect and like where the breakdowns might be. We created um, a bunch of information architecture diagrams for a digital platform. We put together probably a dozen of these for very specific use cases. Um, and this is pretty standard stuff, so I'm not gonna get into details. If you just Google service blueprints or personas, you'll get a lot of information on that. This is what I call a vertical map. In the vertical map, I was trying to connect high-level aspirational vision statements with what was happening at the ground level. I had seen and heard a lot of teams who were doing work on the ground, but they didn't feel like they were connected to the strategic priorities. So I documented as much as I can, I could, and I wanted to create this ladder that kind of takes you from the, the priorities at the top and then those vision statements, which sometimes feel kind of hazy or, or unreachable, and then articulate the principles to support those, uh, which usually come in the form of like bullet points, and then the goals, which are kind of team focused, and goals also feel a bit more concrete. You can put timelines to them. And then the projects and the work streams themselves. And it really seems simple, but trying to create those connections actually kind of starts to create a new organizational structure. It's almost kind of like a new org chart, almost. Like the company wasn't organized this way, but this was our mission. And it also helped some of those teams who felt totally disconnected feel like they were a part of a bigger vision. The other thing that I did yeah, that's what it was like. <laughs> um, the other thing that I did was talk more directly about culture. 
So I would get people together in the same room who had opposing viewpoints just to see what would happen, <laughs> kind of like a bad reality show. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there's a, a very respected designer in Pittsburgh, Mark Redding, who taught me, um, he's led many of these conversations over his career that are really focused on culture and perspective. And he taught me to open up conversations with a simple question, what's going on? And just let them talk. It sounds more like therapy than business, right? Um, but how quickly you can find new direction when you get business partners to really debate on what's going on. Now, having conversations, there's nothing designerly about that. What makes it designerly was that I was oftentimes diagramming those conversations out on the whiteboard, uh, or better yet, trying to get them to diagram things. Like I remember multi-hour workshops of up there, like building out blueprints with these partners to really get to what is going on. So pairing those conversations um, with, uh, with visual techniques really kind of helped heighten understandings. Those are exhausting too, like that's a lot of work because you can't really prepare for those conversations and you're really kind of dancing with it in the moment. Now, all of the stuff that I've shown you today, none of it could be captured in a spreadsheet or a deck or a document. I mean, it could, but it wouldn't really make sense to. I mean, the value would be lost. It's like we're trying to discover and articulate a different dimension of an organization, one that people couldn't see but you could sense it was there, you know, it's like dark matter. You, you maybe sort of know that it's there, but you can't see it, and most people aren't even trying to. But maybe you can see it if you're using the right tools. So when I shared that perspectives diagram and all those other things with, um, with some of my allies and leadership, it actually kind of got them to start taking a step back. And gradually, they started asking questions like these. How do we stay relevant, not just in the years to come, but for generations? How do we create a culture of innovation and not get wiped out by a startup in the middle of the night? How do we create products and services that are in lockstep with, our, with, what, our, or the, with what our clients need and value? How do we make it so that our strategy and what we're building are better aligned? How do we connect with younger people in the market? We've always had the best products out there. I just don't get it. So what's the problem to be solved? Here, these are the real questions get to these. And it's going to take time to get here, but, but once you can define these, that's where the real work is. Finding and trying to tackle these requires cultural change, new forms of agility. For you, it means being comfortable with totally new approaches. And that's going to require a lot of trust. Um, I needed to build up a lot of trust with my peers before they were able to open up. This took a couple of years. And it's going to be messy because none of this really fits into the normal cadence of business or management. Uh, here is another way to look at it. Another one of those diagrams I was making at my desk just for fun. Um, you, have, uh, you have problems and you have solutions, known and unknown. So if you have a known problem and a known solution, that is very straightforward. Start coordinating, start planning, and get to work, implement something, do some quality control, great. If you have a solution but an unknown problem, um, well, let's be honest, like that actually drives a lot of tech today. You know, advanced new technologies kind of getting reversed packaged into a consumer solution. That's fine, uh, that's not my approach, but that's, that's quite common. Typically, the result of that would be maybe something interesting or cool. Uh, oftentimes your market response is gonna be, yeah, but nobody really asked for that. If we have a known problem and an unknown solution, management consultants oftentimes bring in playbooks. We've experienced this before, follow the playbook, follow the recipe, and execute. But wicked problems don't have templates for success. And that's what playbooks and case studies are. They present fairly neat, straight lines to address known problems. And I think that, like, I'm not knocking playbooks here. I think they can be very resourceful at solving critical issues, but that's not really where those existential questions lie. I really believe that it's in these unknown unknowns that are the most ignored and unrealized spaces in business. Organizations don't have teams that are explicitly tasked to address these or even think about them. Maybe they should. It's totally irrational compared to these other approaches, but maybe a little irrationality is what these organizations need, especially these legacy organizations where all that irrationality is long gone and everything has been de-risked. So when you're in the space of these unknown unknowns, there is a whole world of designerly methods that are there to help you out. 
It's how you tame those problems. It's how you frame them properly. And that's gonna take persistence and a degree of independence. So to recap, um, when you go back to work after this, let's just let's review what we just talked about. So you can reveal those contradictions and perspectives through what I call perspective maps. You can visualize complexity through blueprints and journey maps. You can leverage design research methods to help uncover new understanding and create personas uh, to, to really help people get aligned around collective purpose and, and, knowing, and knowing who your audiences are. You can create those vertical maps that'll help create, um, that'll connect the high level vision statements with the work streams. Uh, again, helping to align people and show people how their work ladders up. Prototype ideas through co-design and an iterative design process. Um, this starts to build buy-in and collective direction. If you're bogged down in tech debt or legacy products and corporate stagnation, you could take a step back and start fresh with what I call zero-based design. I didn't really talk about that today, but feel free to connect with me offline if you're interested. And lastly, and most importantly, I'll say invent new techniques that suit your environment. I cannot stress this enough. I came up with all that stuff on the fly. I've never seen a perspective map before. I've never seen a vertical map before. I invented the I zero-based design. Like I came up with all this stuff. When I was doing those let's get real conversations, I was completely winging it. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how those conversations were gonna go. So it was a little bit risky, but like I felt like I had nothing to lose. I think that in the years to come, because of how quickly everything seems to be changing, most, if not all, organizations are gonna to struggle to adapt because they're gonna to continue to try to solve problems through the same old playbook. They're gonna try and treat those wicked problems as tame ones. Many years ago, when we were here in these classrooms around us, um, my students and I carved out a space where we could really bring designerly methods to try and tackle other complex problems at the embassies and at the airport and at the hospital and at the museum. And I think that you should go and do the same wherever you work. And it is not gonna be easy or direct. In fact, it'll probably be the opposite, but it is gonna be more real and it's gonna be more honest and it's gonna be more impactful. Thank you.